same God that never fails will not fail me now. You are failing now in the way to the same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. And your heart is 
You know, when you think about obeying God, when you think about following God, uh, I, I, I hear people all the time, I want to follow God. I want to do, I want to do this for God. I want to uh, let God use me in my major ways. I'm thinking, what are you going to do to adjust your life to follow God? Well, I don't want to do anything. I like my life just like it is. I said, then God's not going to use you. If you want to be used by God, you have to walk up and say, I will do what is necessary to be used by you. I will adjust what needs to be adjusted. I will change what needs to be changed. I will go where I need to go, and I will say what I need to say in order that you might use me. You see, our Father loves us. And he is working on our behalf, much as this army father was, loved his son and was working on his behalf. And, and our father wants us to work for his glory and to see us willing to change our lives to follow him. Unfortunately, a lot of people who claim Christianity, I'm going to use that word claim because I'm not sure they're all Christians. Don't want to pay the cost of following Christ. They don't want to pay the cost of being a disciple of Christ. And as you go through Scripture from front to back, where you find people called by God who were successful in, in following God, every single one of them adjusted their lives to follow God and to be obedient. So we're going to look and we're going to read Luke 14:33. We're going to Discuss it and other other things. So Luke 14, verse 33. And this is just a small one verse of a section, about 10 verses, that talks about the cost of following Christ. So Luke 14, 33, if you found it, go ahead and stand. Luke 33, 30, Luke 14, 33 says, In the same way, therefore, every one of you who does not renounce all his possessions cannot be my disciple. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for this word. We ask that you just use it for your glory. Pray that by your hand, your mercy, and grace, you'll help us to understand what it means to be obedient to you follow you to adjust our lives to you so that you are lifted up and made known. We ask that you do these things for your glory. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And you be seated. So, back in February we started this experiencing God and as we've gotten to the point where we are, we've been talking about this crisis of belief that when God interrupts your life, when he shows up in your life and he says, I've got something I want you to do. It pushes every one of us into a crisis of belief, a crisis of faith, where we have to examine what we say we believe about God and what we say we are willing to do for God. And each of these points are turning, are turning points for our, for our lives. When God shows up and says, hey, I'm here. It's a turning point. It's a major issue. We have to believe it's really God. Then he says, I got something I want you to do. And, and when we encounter him and begin to speak like this, we re 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 realize that this encounter requires me to have faith in him. And that he is about to ask me to do something that only he can do through me. If he can, if, if I can do it on my own, he might just say, kick me that way and go do it. But if he's going to make a point to show up and ask me to do it, then it's probably something that I really can't do on my own. And what you and I do in response to this invitation from God reveals to us, to God and the world, what we really believe about God. So at this moment of crisis of belief, this moment of a crisis of faith, as we respond those who are watching see what we really believe. And if we really believe, what we find out is that true faith requires action. That true faith requires us to move in the direction of God. And so 
after we realize, okay, I am going to be obedient. I want to follow you. We, we hit a critical decision. We, that first short voice of the point up there. A critical decision for you and I is that decision to follow God. Because when we hit that point, God goes, great, here's what I need you to change in your life before you continue on. And it's like, oh, I don't know about that, God. I, I don't know if I want to change anything about my life, God. And God's like, if you want to go from point A to point Z where I'm leading you, guess what? You need to change. Because I can't use you where you are right now. Not for what I need to do. I need you to be obedient and change these things in your life. You see, many of us want to experience this call of God. Please, God, use me, use me, use me. He shows up and says, here it is. And he goes, I don't want to be used that way. That's not what I meant, God. I had an idea of what I wanted to be used, and you didn't, you didn't play fair. You didn't go where I wanted to go. And God's like, no, oh, I'm God. I know what I need to do. I know what's best for your life. I know what I'm doing right now in, in this area around you. I know whose life I'm working on. And I know that when you obey, it's going to impact that person. And that's why I've sent you here right now for this very minute. That you will obey me. And that we can impact the life of somebody who desperately needs me. But God, it's going to require major adjustments in my life to do what you're calling me to do. Yeah, I know that. It's like we don't believe God actually thought the plan through. Trust me, God knows it all. And adjustments are necessary. If you really want to grow in your Christian life, if you really want to be a, put parentheses around this word, a successful Christian, then you must be willing to make the adjustments that our God says need to be made in our lives. If you were to go to a professional training field and you were to watch and you saw the, the baseball guy, he's, he's swinging his bat, and the, and the batting coach came over and said, look, if you make two adjustments to your stance, you will become a better hitter. And uh, that guy goes, I don't need your help. He's going, to be, he's going to remain mediocre. But those who listen to the coach, who know who he's talking, and they, they make their stance, they do a little bit different, and then they, they practice that. Suddenly, they get better. Same thing in football. You know, you got some guy that's running back, and the coach says, look, if you just adjust this and this on how you run these plays and how you think, if you look more often over here, you will improve your game. The guy improves his game because he listens to the coach. When God comes to us and says, I need you to adjust your life in these areas so that I can work for the, my glory, what he is saying is that your game is not as good as it needs to be. And while you are playing a great game, there's just some tweaks that we can do to make it even better. Now, if we're not playing the game at all, it might require major adjustments. But a lot of times, these adjustments really are just minor things that we don't want to give up. We just don't want to give in. You know, but if you come to the Scripture, you will find it biblically. Every person who God used successfully in Scripture adjusted their lives to fit His will. Every single one, a hundred percent. Nobody went, no, God, I'm going to do it my way, and then we're successful. They failed. But those who were willing to adjust their life, and he, he showed up and says, here's what I want to do, and they adjusted their lives, they made an impact on this world. And you see, these adjustments are crucial for you to obey God. For that moment when something comes up in your life and it's a sin opportunity, if you've already adjusted your life, you're able to walk away. If you're prepared, you're able to 
to, to not be there. And as we see in our passage, if God comes along and says, hey, you have this in your possession, I need you to get rid of it or give it away. And we look at verse 33 and it says, therefore, everyone who does not renounce all his possessions cannot be my disciple. That's not saying get rid of them, but it is saying recognize that what you own belongs to God. That everything you have belongs to God. And God comes along and says, look, here's what I want you to do with what you have. And it's going to use up some of those resources, but you need to do it. And a lot of people just don't want to give their resources to God. Look over at verse uh, 26. Now we're talking about how it costs you and I to follow God. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So that hate word is pretty strong, isn't it? Steve, do you hate DC? Not, not today, I realize. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we all have these these. Children, these wives, our, our, our you know, husbands, if you're a female, or the, the mother's sister, I mean, the in laws are not so much hard to hate, right? No. Um, but it's the others that, you know, the blood. So, what is Jesus saying there? He's saying, You have to love me more than you love them. And you have to love me so much that it might inconvenience their lives as you follow me. You know, you can ask Zach. Me being a pastor has not been convenient most of his life. But it's what God called us to. And God may not always ask you to do things that are convenient, but he will definitely do things that will improve your life and move your life forward if you obey. But you have to be willing to make those adjustments. See, we've been given every aspect of our lives to Christ and these things are easier to do. There's a skit years and years and years ago and I've related this to you maybe you've heard of it, maybe you haven't, I don't remember um, of a guy who is standing there and said, God goes what are you going to give me? So he lays his keys, his stuff on it, in his wallet and there he goes well that's not enough and um, he's like well uh, goes through his pockets, lays some more down, lays the deed to his house and all that and God goes, that's not enough. Well, um, uh, you, you know my kids and my wife, you know. If that's not enough, well, the only thing I got left is me, God. Because that's enough. Because once you give him everything, you realize that everything is his anyway. Nothing you and I have, including our own lives, belong to us. If you don't believe that, Challenge God to kill you. And then you can talk to him about it in person. You know? The only reason he won't is because he's got something else he wants to do with you. You know, there's, there is nothing in this life, this whole created order, including every penny, every item in your house, every brick or board in your house, and every nail, even the bugs that you don't like. That don't belong to God. Everything belongs to God. And it's just on loan to you and I. And if you don't believe that, look at what people built in the past and where it's gone. They're gone. They died. Their riches went to somebody else. Their house went to somebody else. Maybe it got torn down. Their land was divided up and sold. And everything they built is gone. Because it belongs to God. Not to you, not to me, but to him. And if our every aspect of our life belongs to Jesus, leaving behind something that he is asking us to change won't be that big of a deal. See, our adjustments to God's call prepares us to be obedient. Because sometimes God will ask us to adjust before he tells us what he needs us to. He says, hey, I, I need you to get this out of your life, or I need you to, to give that away, or to go here. And we can't continue in obedience until this is dealt with. 
A lot of times it's a sin. Sometimes it's not a sin. It's just a, a, you know something that we've held on to that we shouldn't hold on to in a sense that he doesn't have control over it. But whatever God is doing, he wants us to move towards him. And this is our third point where it says God's revelation is your invitation to adjust your life to him. Probably one of the longest points I've ever had. But it's still the truth. God's revelation is your invitation to adjust your life to him. And we can find all throughout scripture people who did this. So Noah, God comes along, says, I'm going to make it rain. I want you to build a boat out here in the middle of nowhere. Noah's like, sure, no problem. I'm going to adjust my life to your call. And for the next hundred years, Noah builds a boat being mocked and ridiculed by everybody he knows. And yet he continues. Abram is living in the nation of Ur, the area of Haran. And God comes along and says, hey, I want you to pack everything up and go to a place I haven't shown you yet. This is Abram's first encounter with God. Okay? God shows up and says, hey, I'm God. I got your mind and you're going to do what I tell you to do. And you're going to leave where you are right now for another place I haven't told you about. How would you like that for your first encounter with God? Okay, see, that's major adjustments. And Abram goes, okay, I'm yours. And he packs it up and leaves. Moses couldn't stay on the backside of the desert and go confront Pharaoh. He had to adjust his life. David could not stay out there with the sheep and go kill Goliath. And then be, move on to become king. He had to adjust his life. Amos had to leave the sycamore trees in order to preach the gospel to Israel. Not the gospel of Christ, but the gospel, the good news. Actually, there was a lot of bad news if you go read Amos about what was coming down the pike, and they didn't change. Jonah had to leave his home and overcome a major prejudice, which I don't think he really did. He hated the Ninevites, and yet he still went and preached to the Ninevites, eventually in obedience to God, because God told him to. Peter, Andrew, James, John all had to leave a fishing business, a thriving fishing business from the sounds of it, in order to follow Jesus. Matthew, he had to leave his taxpayer's table, quit his job, literally quit his job to follow Jesus. He never returned. You know James, Peter, John, and them, they actually went fishing on many occasions. Matthew never collected another penny in taxes. He literally had a major lifestyle change. Saul, who later became Paul, had to leave everything he knew from a child to an adult because he was raised to be a Pharisee. He left all of that to follow Jesus. Major adjustments, but look at what God did through all of these people. And your name will never end up in the Bible. Your name may not ever end up in the newspaper on, on any church bulletin or recollection or a great Christian history book. But God knows your name. And He's written it down, down in the Lamb's Book of Life. And He's he knows if you're going to be obedient or not. And in each case of these people I mentioned, they adjusted their lives so they may obediently follow God. Everything about their lives, they, they had to yield to, to God in order to obediently follow. And if you know each of these people, with most of them, we find out that they didn't do so good sometimes. Noah got drunk. Abram lied on multiple occasions. Moses was a murderer. David was a murderer and a, an adulterer. I don't know anything about Amos. Um, Jonah still hated the people he preached to, even though he preached. Peter, Andrew, James, and John, they all uh, had, had a lack of faith at one point or the other in Christ. And Saul, he killed Christians. And yet they were all people that God used for his glory. And if you think God can't use you, take a step back, swallow that pride, and realize that, yes, God can use you. But because it is actually false pride that makes you think that. So when God calls, he's not going to leave us where we're at. 
is going to require some forward motion. And if we choose to be a rock situated right where we're at, we're not going to change. We will, you know that, that, that right now, you're just going to go to the boss. You're not going to be rolling along. You're not going to be changing. It's not going to be any different. But if you want to be one who is used by God, you've got to be willing to move forward in your Christian life. You've got to leave the baby stuff and begin eating the, 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 the meat of, of the gospel of Christ. And this is that conflict of experiencing God. The greatest conflict that most of us find as Christians is not evading sin. It is actually obeying God. It is adjusting our lives to obey God because we are people who like to get content and complacent where we are. Content is good. In fact, that's biblical. But complacent is satanic. If you get complacent, that means you're not willing to do what needs to be done in order to move forward. That is from the enemy. The conflict of experiencing God is when God shows up and says, here's what I need you to do, and you and I say no. It's not that I'm conflicting with God, it's that I am conflicting with what I have said I'm going to do. At that very moment when I became a Christian, when you became a Christian, this is what you said to God. God, I need you as my Savior and my Lord. It's not one or the other. It's both together. If you want him as Savior, you must make him Lord of your life. And if you reject him as Lord, you have rejected him as Savior. So, you just said, I'm giving control of my life to you. So God comes along and tries to exercise that control. Then you say no. Either you're not saved or you're in disobedience. That's all there is to it. So you and I have to adjust our lives. You see, all people, the non say the non-Christian and the Christian alike, are under God's authority. The lost are out there, they're just going to do what they're going to do. But as a saved person, you've given your life to Christ. You've allowed grace to enter your life. You've allowed salvation to change you. You've allowed God to move you in a way that you, you've never been moved before. You have to make a major adjustment just to get saved. And he wants that kind of, those kinds of adjustments to continue in your life. He says, it's not your life. It's his. And to say, it's my life, is arrogance to God. And if we refuse to adjust our lives, then we're not walking in obedience. God will always, and I don't, I, by the way, I don't like the word always and never. I don't like these kind of words. I, I really try to avoid using them. Um, but in this case, we, understand, we need to understand God will always require adjustments in our lives, minor or big, in order for us to follow Him. Always. Never does He leave us where we are. In order to use us. Our lives are meant to be moving forward. We are supposed to be the catalyst of society. We are the ones that are supposed to go out there and mix things up. If you know what the catalyst is scientifically, you've got this is nice and dormant, and then you go, boop, that boop is the catalyst that messes all of that up. You know, it, 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 it makes everything start going crazy. And things start bouncing off. That's us. We're the catalyst. We're supposed to go out there and mess things up. You know, not, not the mess up little wrong, but mix it up. Make it start happening. Make things move forward. And we can't do that. If we ourselves are back here going, no, I like my world. I've worked hard to make this world just like it is. How many of y'all have said that to God and then he took part of that world away? That's not a fun place to be. And it's, it's, not, it's not something that we want. So get adjusted to God. And I'm not saying those things may or may not get taken. It may be part of it. 
But in order to be obedient, God will do what he has to do in our lives to move us forward. Even Jesus, God himself, God, it, a part of the Trinity, adjusted his life to the Father. 2 Corinthians 8 9 says this, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor, so that through his poverty we might become rich. Oh my God. Jesus literally left the splendor of heaven, the worship of the angels, the, the spectacularness of all that is glorious there. And was born of a virgin into this squalor of an earth, this horrible place, so that he might die on the cross of Calvary for you and I. Now that doesn't mean that Jesus changed, it means he obeyed. It was always, he always knew it was a part of what was going to go on. He did what needed to be done. And if we want to be disciples of Christ, we have to be willing to make adjustments of our lives. Two more examples. Elisha, out there minding his own business, plowing the ground, doing his work for his parents and himself. It was his land and their land. And Elijah comes along, throws his cape on Elijah, Elisha, indicating that you are the next prophet of God. And Elisha takes the stuff that he's using. He, he kills the, the oxen, he offers them on a sacrifice, and he burns the, uh, the plow as a part of that sacrifice, showing that his, his connection to the land is now gone. His connection to his family is now gone. He's following God. He successfully followed the Lord. But how about that rich young ruler that you find in Luke 18, who comes to the... Jesus says, what must I do and Jesus lays it out for him. Do these things. But most of all, you have to go give away your wealth. And it says that the, that man went and did that, right? He went and gave all his no. It says that he basically went away sad because he wasn't willing to make the adjustments necessary in order to follow Christ. I would bet that he, if he had gone and given his wealth away, he would have found more wealth than he ever could have imagined. And what was to follow. That things would have been so great that he couldn't have begun to guess how great they would have been. But he refused to change. So the question of us today is, do we want to be yielded? Do we want to be adjusted? Do we want to be obedient? Because if that's what you want, you need to be willing to obey and adjust your life to him. God wants to use you. From the, the youngest to the two smallest in here who yet are not even to that point of where they can really be used by God for, for much at this point other than just a, a simple word here, here and there because out of the mouth of a child is great wisdom often. To whichever one of you is oldest, I could probably point you out, but I won't do that. God wants to use you. There's not a soul in here this morning. That God is going, oh, done with you. You can do whatever you want. Go have fun. Every one of you are still under his hand. And being as, being as God desires to use you for his glory. Are you willing to adjust your life? Are you willing to, to move to where he is in order that he may be used by, that you might be used to fight him? That's up to you. And it's between you and God. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for this word today. We ask that you encourage us from it. Uh, move in our lives as only you can and, and help us to grasp the reality, reality of it. That adjustments in our lives, small and large, may be a part of what you are wanting to do in order that we may be better equipped to tell others about Jesus and to live a life that honors you. Father, where we are out of step with you, make it clear. Where we are in step with you, strengthen us and encourage us. Lord, we want to be people who impact the area of Somerset and beyond. We want to touch the lives of our neighbors, our family, and our friends, and our co-workers. 
Lord, no, no person, no matter how despicable we might think they are, we should not wish for any of them to go to hell but for all to have everlasting life. And Lord, if that's going to be the case, we have to adjust our thinking, our, our attitudes, our, our lives. We may have to divest ourselves of certain material gains that we have in order to be obedient and to follow you. Father, we ask that you use us for your glory and Bring us into your kingdom even further than we are now, that we may be obedient to you in all things. And it's in that name of Christ we pray.